Oh my God, I was wrong. It was the disenfranchised podcast all along. Yes, you finally made a monkey out of us, the disenfranchised podcast, where that podcast all about those franchises of one, those films that fancy themselves full-fledged franchises before falling flat on their face after the first film. Almost forgot my motherfucking intro there. Uh, I am your host, Stephen Foxworthy, and joining me, as always, the damnedest, dirtiest human of them all, it's Tucker. Hey, Tucker. Hi, Stephen. How's it going? Not bad. How are you? Samesies. Right on. It bears mentioning at this point that our co-host, Brett Wright, has uh, followed his pet uh, chimpanzee, Pericles, into a uh, chrono storm. Uh, we may spend the next decade or two looking for him, or he may have gone back in time. We're not sure. Um, we don't know. But we would like to see him again. Uh, we sure hope we sure hope we do. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, we're we're talking this month about movies uh, that parallel movies that are in theaters right now or coming up in theaters. I guess I should say I I kind of misjudged the release date on this one, kind of like I did with uh, uh, the uh, the Godzilla King of the Monsters uh, episode or Godzilla versus Kong episode that we did a while a couple years ago, whenever that movie came out. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm rambling at this point. Hey, wait, do we have to do a a, a re-enfranchised for that? Or did you guys do the old one? Did we do the we old did, one? We, we did, did the, the ninety. We did the ninety-seven gorilla and or Godzilla, and we did the uh, the Peter oh, Jackson King Kong. I thought you meant you did like the the Godzilla Kong movie that came no, out. No, no, I was no, like, no. Wait a minute. I feel like I would have been part of that, and I don't remember that. No, we bungled the release date on those episodes. Um, so they came out like two weeks, like the episode, the, the episode dropped like two weeks before that movie did. And so we were like, well, fuck. Um, oops. oops. Like we did this one. Cause I thought the movie was coming out this upcoming weekend. Uh, it came out last weekend or really, yeah, I think maybe the weekend before last, like it's been out. Um, it was last so, weekend. Oops. Big damn and oops on my it's part. It's kind of a, it's kind of the beginning of a new trilogy, from what I. That's understand, what I've heard. At least a new, a new story. Like you don't have characters from the original trilogy. It's like further in time. Yeah, in it's carrying on. Universe. It's carrying on the circus one, but it's like years hence, kind of a thing. Um, Too bad we won't get any more Steve Zahn. He was my favorite part about. Uh, we'll that get one it. That we'll, he was in. We'll get into it, but I haven't seen any of those yet. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay. So because because Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes has come out, we are finally getting to talk about a movie I've been wanting to talk about on this podcast since the very beginning, because I have a torrid history with this movie. Tucker, what are we talking about today? We're talking about Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. From 2001, it's Planet of the Apes, directed by Tim Burton, written by William Broyles Jr., Lawrence Connor and Mark Rosenthal and starring Mark Marky Mark Wahlberg, Tim Roth, Helena Bonham Carter, Michael Clark Duncan, the late great dearly departed. Uh, speaking of late great and dearly departed, Chris Christopherson in this movie as well. Estella Warren, Paul Giamatti, uh, the great Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa in this movie, uh, David Warner, Eric Avari, um, Lisa Marie. Lisa Marie. Yeah. Glenn Shaddix, Chris Ellis, Anne Ramsey, Michael Jace, um, like, God, what? Uh, Charlton fucking Heston, uh, Linda yeah. Harrison, also in a blink and you miss it cameo in this thing. Like, what a cast. Yeah. What, what a picture. Even your boy Rick Baker is in this. He is. He, he has a cameo as yeah. one of the monk boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smoking yeah. on that hookah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, monkeys. How's it going? How's your mother? Hey, so how do you mother for me? <laughs> That's all I can think of this whole movie. No, particularly that last inspiring speech that he gives. He's like, hey, <laughs> you know, we got this like the shared history, bro. Like, come on. <laughs> like, you, we're all we're all people. And like, uh, you're, you're from my past. And or you're from my future and I'm from your past and, and, and we can like we can for totally do this, bro. It's been done before. I've seen it happen, yo. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. That's <laughs> accurate. And, you know, it's surprising uh, that that you when I said that I hated everybody in this movie, 
and specifically Tim Roth, mm-hmm. which feels like blasphemy. But have you seen this movie? Um, and you were like, not Mark Wahlberg. No, Mark Wahlberg is perfectly fine in this. He just does his Mark Wahlberg thing. Like, whatever. I mean, like disagree. he's not great in it. Like, like, look, he has. Mark Wahlberg can act, which has been proven by a few movies, including few see our them. previous episode on The Departed, The Departed and Fear. Those two and movies. I will throw in for your consideration The Fighter. Oh, I haven't seen that. So that I'll check that out for sure. I've wanted to see that. Like, I, I think I own it, actually, on my it's booty, good, but I haven't watched it yet. It's good. Um, But no, he's whatever. Like, he's the least like one of the least egregious things about this film because he's just just doing his mock warbrook thing whatever then you Meanwhile, have people like tim roth what does he even do what is that i i will like, we look we will get into oh it. my god and i love tim roth so much so much i think he's fantastic and the, here's I, what I will say for Mark Wahlberg in this movie. I don't think I have seen a more him in a more fundamentally miscast role since oh, M. Night Shyamalan's The Happening. <laughs> what? He has the no. he has the eyes. He has the eyes for The Happening. That's I think what got him hired. He can him do and that. Zoe like, Deschanel. Deer, yeah. uh, deer in the headlights look really really well. He's got a doughy well, I, face, you know. <laughs> And look, we're going to have plenty of opportunities to talk Mark Wahlberg on this podcast going forward because we still have Four Brothers. We still have uh, oh, Max Payne. Um, so Four Brothers is one. a good movie. Yeah, Max Payne, not so much. Um, we've already, But we've already talked about him in The Departed and The Italian Job, which again, I don't mind him in The Italian Job because oh, no. that's he's, he's just doing what he's doing. Oh, a fourth movie Mark Wahlberg acting very well in, Boogie Nights. Oh yeah. Thomas I always forget Boogie about Nights. that one because he's so good in it. Like I don't even think it's him, I guess. Right. <laughs> I yeah. Know. No, he's it's the he's only so good I think it. it's the only role that I think he's good in where he actually transforms into someone else. Mm-hmm. Because in fear, he's a psychotic ex boyfriend. And yep, that tracks. And in the departed, he's just a fucking asshole. Though an asshole with a heart of gold, I will say. He is a good guy at the end of the day. But why is he a fucking when, asshole? When it's all said and done, he's maybe the only one. <laughs> he's the only good guy, yes. Imagine a movie where Mark Wahlberg's the only good guy. Where he's he's That's the, the redeemable character, yeah. <laughs> and he's still a huge piece of shit. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> so, like, we've talked Wahlberg. We will have more opportunities to talk Wahlberg. Uh, but this is, like, probably dead center right in the middle of the Wahlberg. Oh, Mile 22. I can't believe I've... And Spencer Confidential. No, we've got... And Scoob! We've got so many fucking opportunities to talk to Mark Wahlberg. Oh, great. We can I can't wait. A, we can do a Mark Wahlberg fucking theme month if we really wanted to. Do we really um, want to, though? No. Okay. Oh, and Good. you know what else? You know what else he's in? Uncharted. Probably Didn't one we're going to cover. Neither did I. Brett really it liked because it. Because he could, I think he could have been Nathan Drake. Is that the main character's name? Yeah. I think he could have played the Tom Holland part because having played those games, he's more age appropriate for that part. He's definitely not age appropriate for the role he ended up playing. But like, that's the thing with those, know, with these franchise starters, man. You want to cast it young so you get someone who can grow into the role. That's I'm why Holland saying. was cast as Spider Man in the first place, man. They wanted someone and who looked really fucking young. And that makes sense for Spider Man. But in the games, Nathan Drake is always like, I'm. I think I'm getting that name wrong, but you know what I'm talking no, about. No, I don't he's, think you are. He's like no younger than thirty in any of those games. And his mentor is like in his 60s. And that's the exactly. character Mark Wahlberg plays in Correct. the movie. And so, like, I just never, I want to see it because I've seen some of the action set pieces and they look impressive. And they're very obvious callbacks to action set pieces in the game, which are the strengths of those games. Mm-hmm. Especially at the beginning of three, when you have to climb through those train cars that are also falling off a cliff at the same time. Yep, it's really intense, and they do that in the movie, and I I want to see it for that, but I just can't bring myself to do it because, like, I don't know, I'm up for different interpretations, but come on. My That's... my ex was a big fan of those games, so I've watched all but the most recent one being oh, played. So much fun, and yeah. they're I mean, watch they're very cinematic video games, but mm-hmm. 
at the end of the day, you're watching them and you're just like, or you're watching the movie and you're just like, well, it should, I, I could be playing this instead. Like this could be more yeah. interactive, but yeah, I'm sure we will cover Uncharted at some point, unless they do make a sequel, which apparently they're still talking about, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think Tom Holland's kind of burn out on some stuff, which I don't blame him for, to be honest. No, no. His star is bright, burning bright. It is. To make it sure it doesn't sure. burn too bright, Tom Holland. Mm. We love you, Tom Holland. We don't want to see you crash and burn. Correct. And I mean, some of the some of the non Marvel stuff he's been doing has been not terribly well received. So, and it sucks because from what I've read, he's put a ton of effort into those, and they just suck because of mm-hmm. other reasons. You know, right. I mean, I think the Russo's big follow up to uh, the Avengers shit, uh, Cherry, he was in that, which yeah. I did not hear very good things about. There's, no. He's in a Robert Pat. He's in a movie with Robert Pattinson called. Um, oh, what's it called? I like uh, the Devil Pat- All the Time. I do, too. Is that good? Should I watch that? Is it good? Uh, Is I haven't seen it. Day? I don't know. Shit. Okay. I can't. I, I. I don't know. I can tell you he. What. What he's not good at is uh, chaos walking. See our previous episode on chaos walking. Did I watch that? Uh, I don't. You were not on the podcast at the time. Okay. I. You know. Sometimes in those days, though, I would watch the movie so that I would have context. Um. But I don't it, remember that thing. one. It's like the most forgettable movie ever. It's him and Daisy so maybe Ridley. I did. Uh. No, maybe. I didn't see that, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I maybe when it, that came out, it might as well not exist. Like that one came out yeah. in 2021, and I was just like looking for a 2021 movie to cover at the end of the year, and I was like, this movie may as well not even exist. Let's cover it. And that was, that was kind of our our takeaway: is this movie doesn't exist, even though we absolutely both just watched it. Brett, I think, liked it a lot more than I did. What a waste of a good two good leads too. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, the the rest of the cast is really solid too. You've got uh, Demian ba- Bashir, who's one of one of my favorite. I love that guy. That guy is like a really underrated actor. Um, Who David, Ay- where do I know him from? Demian Bashir. Um, I, he's yeah. in he's in the Hateful Eight. I'm pretty sure. Yes, uh, right. he was Oscar nominated for a movie, uh, A Better Life. He's in okay. Machete Kills. He's in Godzilla okay. versus Kong. Uh, he's also oh, in The I Nun. Love that movie. He's in the Didn't Nun, Al- Alien Covenant. Um, like he's 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 good in a lot of stuff. Link man. me to the really IMDb. In- I need to see his face. Okay. I gotta see it because like these are things I've seen, but I don't know who this is. We're looking right now. Oh, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never knew his name. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, he's in stuff. Uh, yeah, he. I love him Come and on, another one of. The- Another one of those actors who's just in like everything, but like you, is, nev- yeah. <laughs> you don't know his name, uh, Jose Zuniga. Uh, that guy no fucking rules. Uh, this guy, and he's he's another one of those that guy actors where you're just like, oh that guy, yeah, I know that guy. Oh yeah, that guy. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's a lot of TV stuff too. I see him on he TV is. a lot too. He does a lot of TV, but he's done some movies yeah. as well. Like he's he was in The Dark Tower. See our previous episode on The Dark Tower. Like, yeah. uh, but no, I, I love, I love those two. Like if they, if they were to do a two hander together, I'd go see it. I'd watch it. Yeah, for sure. But no, listen, listen to the cast on this, um, chaos walking movie. It's Tom Holland, Daisy Ridley. You're those your leads. Uh, Demian Bashir, yeah. David Ayelowo, Kurt Sutter, the guy who gave us sons of anarchy, Cynthia yeah. Erivo, Mads Mikkelsen. And for some oh, reason, Nick Jonas is in this thing too. Oh, that's cool. Like, it's 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 a weird weird cast but it's and it's kind of one of those things where like nick jonas like is barely in it because you're like oh he's gonna be in the sequel and there was no yeah. sequel oh boo but uh i mean that's why we covered it but yeah brett really liked the david yellow character and i think ended up like creating a character for either one of his books or one of his D campaigns or both based on that concept he really liked that so word that's word. cool that's but yeah cool. that's not why we're here though no, I guess not. We're we're here to talk about Tim Burton's 2001 Planet of the Apes. And Tucker, I am curious, what is historically been your relationship with the Planet of the Apes franchise and and your relationship with this movie specifically? 
Okay, well, I've seen... Um, so you have your original series of Planet of the Apes movies, so the original mm-hmm. films plus the animated series and the live-action television series. Right. And I've seen those things. Okay. I couldn't tell you which ones or... I just I've I've watched ape movies and TV shows on cable when I was a child. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really do much with it after childhood. Uh, this movie came out, and I think I rented it maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay. And boy, does it suck. Um, <laughs> the new ones, the new ones are pretty good. The fir- the 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 original trilogy of the reboots or prequels, whatever they're wanting to call them. Uh, the more recent ones, that first trilogy was really cool because it starts with a, a very grounded sort of kind of a small movie for the franchise. Yeah. It's a very, mm-hmm. very small movie, comparatively speaking. And then when the origin, original director dipped out for the sequels, they got uh, that one dude that did those other movies that was really good. Um, and- <laughs> is that is that is that Matt Reeves? Yes, dude. The Batman guy. Yeah. And he took something that was already really, really rad and just elevated it. That's like kind of that his one, MO. That first one is really good and it feels complete and and I really enjoyed it. But the the other two just they're, they're the it's kind of the perfect sequels. Like if you want to study sequels that elevate the original and just get better and better those two are the ones you want to watch because they just take that simple concept and just run with it and go so many places that you would never expect them to based on the first film. And uh, it's a really good trilogy. You should watch them, Steven. I want to, I own them. I need to, I own them on 4k. Oh yeah. Cause you got all them. They got the whole set dude. And this is part of it. This movie's part of it. I got the nine movie collection. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I got basically every planet of the apes movie released up until last year. Uh, I have in one massive collection, and is it's the cartoon on there, and the TV no, show. They oh, don't ooh. have the they don't have the series. They only have the films. Uh, although I am looking, and uh, you can buy the complete TV show on DVD on Amazon for twenty seven fifty four, and it looks like the animated series might be out of print. It's probably you can watch it on YouTube. I'm sure most I'm cartoons sure. you can watch on YouTube. Yeah, and you it can probably might watch it might... the actual live action show on youtube as well if i'm I was gonna I'm say gonna it, it might be streaming somewhere as well yeah. like somewhere officially so i have very fond memories of the live action tv show i couldn't tell you anything about it but it was at like i when i was watching it i was having a good time in life as a child right on yeah. um but yeah no i uh i have always dug the planet of the apes man i love the apes um and I, I don't remember when I first engaged with Planet of the Apes. I think it was before this movie came out and I got really excited and wanted to get into Planet of the Apes. I think I remember my first job ever was at a Hobby Lobby, uh, the one in Greenwood. Um, mm-hmm. And we, we would sell like model kits and stuff. And they had a bunch from like old TV shows and they had one from the Planet of the Apes TV show. And that was when I first learned there was a Planet of the Apes TV show. And I'm like, well, I want to watch that movie. And so I think my dad and I got it from the library and we watched it. The original? It. Yeah, the original 1968 nice. Frank Schaffner movie. And <clears throat> we watched it. And I was like, this is great. I love this. I I want to make this like my franchise. And so I like tried to find the other. I couldn't find the other movies, couldn't find the show. I couldn't find anything. But when this movie came out, my dad and I were there opening weekend to see this movie. And oh, you I, poor, poor bastards. <laughs> I so wanted it to be good that I convinced myself it was. And I was no stranger to this because I had done this just a couple years earlier with The Phantom Menace, uh, oh. where I was just like, this is Star Wars. This is like, this it's is got to be good. Thing. I'm the problem. Right. Exactly. It's not the right. movie. I'm the one who has an issue. Like it's not and I absolutely saw that movie in theaters at least twice. Um <laughs> Phantom Menace. Um but I uh this this movie I only saw the once, but I you better believe I asked for it on DVD, like I owned it. Um 
loved it and then eventually ended up getting rid of it at some point hadn't really given it much thought in years other than to like throw it on this list um but uh yeah i got a chance to re-engage with it and uh oh boy do i have some thoughts um it's real bad it's real real bad uh baby steven is an idiot um i think i can uh confidently say that um but I mean, there's there's still some stuff I like in here. Like it's not unsalvageable, yep. but it's Paul not Giamatti. Good. Yeah, I agree. Paul I, I would say th- things plural. I would say. Oh, interesting. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, but no, I I I dug this movie so much. This is one of my first Paul Giamatti films, actually. Really? I think. Really. I think this That's is exciting. Early, this, this is yeah. Look, I fucking hate this movie, but I absolutely love Paul Giamatti in it. Like, if it were just a movie of him, I would sit through two hours of it and want more. But Mm -hmm. it's just everything else around Paul Giamatti is garbage. Yeah, I I think it might be, honestly, I think it might be one of his best performances. Just because of how shitty the movie he is, how shitty the movie is and how fantastic of a performance he puts in. And he always does well in comedies. And he's obviously, he's the comedic character in this movie, which if you ask me, this movie needed a little more comedy and a little more camp because it takes itself way too fucking seriously. Agreed. Way too seriously. (laughs) Tim Roth, I'm looking at you. I have other problems with this movie beyond just how seriously it takes itself, but I do think every problem. problems. Every problem with this movie that's not Paul Giamatti. (laughs) So when Paul, when Paul Giamatti was doing his like Oscar, um, like doing the rounds, like campaigning for his Oscar earlier this year, uh, I heard, I saw an interview with him about this movie and apparently like someone had called someone from the movie had called him in casting had called his agent and his agent was like, no, Paul's not going to want to do that. And Giamatti's like heard about it and he goes, What? You tr- get them back on the phone and you accept that right now. And then when he when he finally got on the phone with somebody, he's like, you're going to make me a, you're, you're going to make me an ape. Right. He goes, I'm not going to be a, I'm not going to be a human. You're going to make me an ape. Great. Because that's the only condition under which I'll do this movie. Like oh, he yeah. wanted to be in this movie. He wanted to be an ape. Um, I know you and I are going to disagree with about this, but I, I actually like the makeup effects in this movie for the most part. There are Look, a few that don't work very well for me. Here's but I the think- thing. One of the things that makes Giamatti's performance stand out is his ability to act as well as he does in that makeup because not everybody is. is he able to works do that with well. the makeup. He is conscious of the makeup and he makes it a part of his performance. And that's what everybody should have been doing. But Correct. you're right. Um, I think he works think- in it best. And I think that's part of why he shines so brightly in this movie is because he is in a lot of ways the most believable ape performer. Yeah, I, I believe it. Like, and, and the thing about the effects is the effects are amazing. Like the, the effort that mm-hmm. uh, that Rick, Rick Baker put into the designs. The great they Rick all, Baker. Like, like technically, like that is a, a technical feat. Mm-hmm. Like he should be really proud of it, but also it's fucking ugly. Remember, there was a movie a couple of, a couple episodes back, I was saying the same thing where the effects were fantastic, but it was just so total recall. That's what it was. Total recall. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same sort of deal where like, like standing ovation for the effects, but also they're ugly as shit. Yeah. I mean, Baker, like a lot of makeup guys was a big fan of the original film because I mean, it's, I would not have known that from watching this movie. Honestly, it's set for hell in the bottom Carter who looks fucking awful in this movie. <laughs> With her sideburns. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I, and this is the movie that made Tim Burton stand up and take notice of her. Why do the why do the girls only the girls have hair? I don't know, man. None of the dudes have hair. The girls have like actual human hair. Every single one of them. But here's the thing. They put human hair know. on them, but they give them the, the fuzzy face to a certain point. That's all right. I could think about at the end when Mark Wahlberg was giving her her sympathy kiss that he gave her yeah. before he went and macked on the real girl he was wanted. Um, like he put his hand on her face and I'm like, that's it's the full beard. 
right there on the side. You're just touching a full beard. Well, and and like, I mean, that's that's what Zero looks kind of similarly looks like in in the um, in the original. That's the like, thing. She's I think like these. The... I think these effects are too good for this movie. I think what worked for the original films is they knew the material and they knew how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And like we were saying before, this movie takes itself way too seriously. The old ones, they managed to be good and like, like good films Mm -hmm. and still, you know, be a little campy and be a little silly while not like compromising the tone of the film, you know, like the serious tone of the film. Well, it, but, and that's and what I this think... film is missing for me is it's just too, it's too fuck. It's for Paul Giamatti. It's too, everybody's like hamming it up in the wrong way. They're all way too serious. And Oh my God, there's, it's such a bad movie, Steven. Well, I think the major failing of this movie, and there are many, but I, for, for me, the major failing of this movie is the fact that we have the, the original films are doing like sci-fi as it's supposed to be done, which is this like we're taking science fiction and using it as a lens to look at where we are right now as a society. Like Star Trek. Like Star Trek. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and, and it's, it's doing it very well. It's like, it's using the, the ape human relationship as a microcosm to just, to talk about religion, to talk about race, to talk about all like science, all sorts of things, uh, you know, dogmatism, all these things that are like really affecting society and are affecting society still today, like very prescient in that way. All of those original films have a, and I think the original director would say, these are political films. I, I have a political point to make when I'm making this. Um, I don't think Tim Burton is capable of making a movie about anything other than weird people finding other weird people. I am I am convinced that is all Tim Burton can do as a filmmaker. I think that the difference between the social commentary in this film and what in the original commentary? films exactly is in the original films the reason that it works and it's just like the x-men 97 series and the original x-men 92 series is the same where it's an obvious allegory but the references they make to it are not on the nose mm. like they get creative and and make those those tropes fit the world of the film instead of just using real world tropes and throwing an ape on it instead of like an N word or something. Right. Like it's too on the nose. Like everything, instead of like making up their own things to reference things in the real world, they just use the real world thing, real world things and replace it like with a gorilla pun or something. Right. And it's really fucking annoying Mm -hmm. and it's kind of disrespectful, (laughs) honestly. It is in a lot of ways. No, it's, I mean, it, Cause I'm sitting there and I'm watching this and I'm waiting for like some kind of like point to emerge. And then the movie ends and I'm like, wait, what the fuck was that for? Because again, I feel like science fiction and horror, like genre filmmaking, you have a very unique opportunity to like tell stories that are about the society in which we live in a way that is, in a way in in a way that you can't do with like a normal film because if you make like a normal political film about people living in this time and place it's going to get a huge reaction but if you can if you can put a science fiction veneer on it you can do and be a lot more bold and a lot more daring in what you're doing because you're making a point and sometimes See starship troopers starship Tro- very good example um, and sometimes you 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 don't go broad enough with it with the allegory like Bright, upcoming episode of this podcast Bright. Still haven't seen it, but I am excited to. I'm not excited, but I haven't seen it either. Um, All right. um, we'll or or you go or you go like the right amount of. You can also go like too broad with it um, mm-hmm. to where it just it, it just doesn't hit. But this isn't trying to do anything at all because again, I don't. I feel like Burton doesn't know how to do anything other than make movies about little weirdos being weird. Well, I think, I think that there 
in this story, there are things that you can't avoid, um, you know, comparisons to the real world with with racism and classism and stuff like that. So it has right. to be in the movie. The only way he knows to deal with it is to make puns on actual racial slurs or stereotypes and stuff. And it just yeah. gets really annoying really fucking quick. Yeah, right. Like Real monkey quick. is a, monkey is a derogatory term, and we learn that because he says it, and another ape gets offended. Like he gets real, real mad. Yeah, he does. He like tackles him to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. The great Kerry Hiroyuki uh, Tagawa, I who I did not realize was in this film. I saw him in the credits. I'm like, who is he? And then I, I like about halfway through the movie, I looked at the IMDb page, and I'm like, is he the is he the servant for Helena Bonham Carter's dad? And sure enough, that that is that is who Kari, the great Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa is playing. Um, man, this I did. I desperately wanted this movie to be good when I first saw it. Like I had, I had a, I had Planet of the Apes T-shirts. Man, I had a a T-shirt with Cornelius and or Caesar from the Planet of the Apes films uh, dressed like um, what's his name, um, Che Guevara. That I that I wore a lot. In oh college. yeah, I've seen those. And I had a buddy or a, a a guy I knew. I wouldn't call him a buddy, but a guy I knew. Go. So, are you a big Che Guevara guy, or do you just like Planet of the Apes? I'm like, I, I just like Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, Oh, cool, political kindred. Oh no, you just like the you just like the monkey movies. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, I think I think this was kind of the nail in the coffin for me with um tim burton because i yeah i feel like this is the beginning of the end for tim burton outside of big fish and i would say sweeney todd and as well i haven't liked anything else that he's done again i kind of feel the same way but for sweeney todd now i'm sure we're going to talk about this again when we do our re-enfranchised on beetlejuice beetlejuice because sure Yep, but I think Gosh, I really hope that goes well. I am excited I to see that movie. I hope that with I'm with not. everybody back, you know, I'm hoping that it goes really well. Michael Keaton, I've seen some uh, online stuff that he's been doing, like the the um where they talk about all the roles they played in their career, like for GQ or mm -hmm. whoever does those. I've seen a couple of those, and he seems to be really psyched. And he's always talking about how like it's like. Like, like Tim's been doing this stuff for years where he's just like doing studio stuff, but this is like the old days and like, it's kind of gotten me hyped. Kind of me hyped for it. Here's the thing I will say. Keaton is the reason, and I'll say this again on the episode that we record on it, but mm -hmm. Keaton's the reason that movie got made. Like his resurgence in popularity, I think is the reason that movie exists Fucking at all. It, it took him... It took him literally 10 years since Birdman to get it off the ground. But I think that was the one like Keanu Reeves and Constantine, like Beetlejuice was always the one that Keaton was kind of trying to push uphill. Um, yeah. And it, but I mean, look, Tim Burton, the first, I would say 10, 11 years of his career, unimpeachable in 85, you got Pee Wee's big adventure. You got Beetlejuice Fantastic. in 88, Great. Batman, 89, sure. Edward Scissorhands in 90, Batman Returns in 92, the most Tim Burton movie there ever has been. Ed Wood, <laughs> Ed Wood in 94, and Mars Attacks in 96. Ed Wood's my favorite spoilers. Same. Pee-wee is same. a close second. Pee-wee's a very close second. Mars Attacks is second for me. Really? That's I lower love, on most people's lists. I really like that is. movie, too. I love it's Mars Attacks. It's much higher on my list than it is on most people's, but it ain't no number two, I'll tell you that. No, oh, no. And, which, you know, fair. I just have a soft spot for that movie. Um, I can dig it. In 99, you have Sleepy Hollow, which I don't care for, but I know a lot of people it's really fine. Like. It was it was it was good enough for me to not lose faith. Right. You know, right. And then you've got Planet of the Apes in 2001. Uh, you got big you got Big Fish in 2003, which oh, is his Oscar I play. Like, I liked that one. It was really good. It was so that awesome. Was, and it that made was me the feel good in my heart the second Tim Burton movie I saw in theaters. <laughs> then so you got cool. in 2005, you got the double whammy of Charlie and the chocolate factory uh, and corpse bride. Meh. In 2007, you got Sweeney Todd, the demon barber fleet street, which I, again, okay. I saw in theater. I do dig yeah. that one. Um, 
in 2010, Alice in Wonderland. And, and that's, that's when I was, I was fully out on Tim Burton by 2010. Yeah. He was like a parody was, of himself. That movie was a parody of Tim Burton. That movie just it was like AI like, generated Tim Burton yes, is what that it, was. <laughs> it really felt like it. Yeah. Uh, and then you have 2012, you have dark shadows and Frankenweenie. See our previous episode on dark shadows. Uh, you've got big eyes in 2014, Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children in 2016 and Dumbo in 2019. Like he's basically spent ever like the time since planet. Of the, it, it's like a downward progression. It's like a he's downward retired. Spiral. He's retired from Tim Burton movies and just started making movies. Right. That have that are kind of Tim Burton in aesthetic only. You know, he's a competent filmmaker, so, you know, you can count on him to make something that is right. at least competent, whether he puts his personal stamp on it or not. I, I mean, my opinion, and this is me, and I think I've mentioned this on one of the Tim Burton movies we've covered before, either Beetlejuice or Dark Shadows. I don't remember which. But in my opinion, Tim Burton just kind of ran out of stuff to say. After yeah. Batman Returns and Ed Wood, he just is like, I've made these are my statements. Like I made my 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 weird lone loner outsider movie and I made, uh, you know, my movie about filmmaking. I'm done. And then people are like still coming to him with ideas. And he's like, I mean, I like making money. I, I guess I could. I guess yeah, I could and this, making know? movies is fun. Sure. Like I get sure. it. I'm not I'm not mad at him at all. No. Like that doesn't mean I'm going to enjoy the films, but I'm not like saying fuck Tim Burton. Like, yay, no. Tim Burton. Like make get that cheddar, Tim Burton. Like make do that what money you gotta do, man yeah yeah absolutely i'm not even but, mad <laughs> but it feels like he doesn't have it feels like there's no flesh in the game anymore for him it is yeah it is sad when i watch something like vincent and you see that creative spark in that sh have you seen vincent i haven't i have it it's on my um fuck, what's it called uh it's on my nightmare before christmas like deluxe box set dvd that is i think for me and this feels weird saying because of how good Pee Wee is and how good Ed Wood is, but I think Vincent is my favorite thing he's ever done. Oh, wow. It's really, really good. And your boy, Vincent Price, narrates it, dude. Right. Like, and it was kind of like a, his love letter to Vincent Price, and then he reached out and Vincent mm. was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yes. And then they ended up it's becoming so friends. Like the, the relationship between Ed Wood and uh, Bela Lugosi in Ed Wood is based on his relationship with Vincent Price. Yeah. Very similar for sure. So, yeah. I mean, like I, I admire him as a filmmaker, but I feel like he had a good like 12 year run. And ever since then, I don't care. Like, and I know there are people yeah. who are like Tim Burton stands and they love everything he does, but I'm not, I'm not that guy. Uh, and again, this is a Tim Burton heavy year for us. We're going to be covering three Tim Burton movies this year. This is the first of three. What are the other ones? Can you tell well, me on Mike? I can tell you on Mike because okay. when Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice comes out, we're going to be oh, doing yeah, a Beetlejuice the, redux that. because really, you if were anything's not with us be a, when we covered Beetlejuice. If anything's going to be a return to form, it's got to be Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Come on, man. Come on, you guys. I know you can do it. Come on. Don't let me down, you guys. And Don't per our per our covenant with our audience, we're covering Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice the next week. So, Oh. That That's three like Tim Burton cheap. movies, bitch. It's three movies, but I, you made a big deal of it, and it's like two movies that are just Beetlejuice. They're two distinct movies directed by Tim Burton. What the fuck else do you want from me? Do you think there's do you think there's gonna be stop motion in Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, Steven? I I hope so. Is that gonna be on your so. bingo card? Is that gonna it's, be on your Beetlejuice Beetlejuice no. bingo card? No, because so I think he's to... I think he's gonna farm it out and do it with uh CG. I think if uh Alice in Wonderland taught us anything, it's that he's he's probably not gonna spend the extra money yeah, to do but that. But this is this is Beetlejuice. This is one of this was this was a big movie for him the original i agree and like, i have to imagine a guy that look someone who has a specific creative voice like they could be fine doing whatevs and just making money but that that voice still lives inside of them dude i don't know that i can't it imagine that he's that's kind of my whole point is i don't know that it does i can't believe it, that i'm the more hopeful of the two of us i feel like usually it's the other way around 
it feels like a cold corporate cash grab to me and I'm not looking forward to seeing it. I will watch it for this podcast, but I'm not looking forward to it. I really hope you're wrong, Stephen. And I hope that you I hope, hope I am you're too. wrong as well. No, yeah. I absolutely hope that I am. I don't think it, I Can am. you imagine a good Beetlejuice sequel now? How amazing that would be with that cast. I would look, I would love for it to happen, but I can't imagine Fuck. it. I don't know what it And they shot like. in Vermont. They shot in Vermont, dude. Same place they shot the first one. Fantastic. Cool. Yeah, dude. Your girl, your girl Jenna Jenna Ortega is gonna be there, dude. I mean, cool. No I, Jeffrey I, I Rush, so we're good. We're good. No Jeffrey Rush. No, uh Jeffrey Jones. Same thing. It's not, but no. same thing. <laughs> it's very much not. not the same thing. <laughs> No, um, <laughs> registered sex offender Jeffrey Jones will not be in the film. Oh, that's another one where it makes me so mad. Like, it's it's sad the things that he did, sure. But in, in a very much lesser complaint, man, I really liked him in a lot of movies. He was like the best part of a lot of movies. There's Ferris a part Bueller? of me that's kind of Shit. surprised he's not in this, honestly. Because, like, Burton kept working with him. That's true. So did the Deadwood guys. Mm -hmm. He has a very, a, a much reduced role in the Deadwood movie, but he's there. And like, honestly, I don't blame them because you can't, like, you can't not have him there. If you've seen Deadwood, like, you can't, you I've can't seen make that all movie but like without the him. last couple episodes of the last season, honestly. <laughs> you, you can't make that movie without him. I wish you could. Like, I hate to see him get money or whatever. I, and honestly, I hope that he's reformed and has is a good man now but you know for his past sins i hope that he doesn't get money for that kind of stuff but you can't you can't do it like deadwood it's not deadwood without the newspaper guy like yeah, i mean he's kind of i a get a big, big part of the story but that is that is the last him. thing that he has done yeah well maybe was... he took an l man maybe he was like i suck so maybe i should better myself and get out of the public eye we can only hope I, but I think everything that he does tends to get met with some backlash. Burton, the last thing he worked on with Burton was Sleepy Hollow, it looks like. So Burton Burton stopped working with him after that. Uh, but you know who is in this movie? Speaking of Beetlejuice, the who great, that? the late, great Glenn Shaddix. Wait, who's that? That's uh, Otho from uh, Beetlejuice. Oh yeah he's another like burton also. mainstay yeah he's the best who's like, he in this movie he is the senator the orangutan with the big pudgy face the the one who's married uh ditzy lisa, lisa marie. marie monkey yeah Correct. yeah 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 <laughs> who is lisa i felt Marie's so bad i was so embarrassed for everybody in this movie but her especially honestly yeah. uh She's glenn shaddock's also that the was mayor embarrassing in the nightmare oh. before christmas Oh yeah, with the two faces, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what a what a great what a great actor. Loved loved Glenn Shaddix. Um this and movie no. needed some Paul Rubens, man. I mean, the only role I can see Paul Rubens in is the Paul Giamatti role. And frankly, I'm glad I'm glad we got Paul Giamatti instead of Paul Rubens. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Like I think that's the, the Mark better Wahlberg Paul for role. that role. As Pee Wee. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch the hell out of this movie, this exact movie, except it's Pee Wee Herman instead of Mark Wahlberg. I'm there for it. Opening day, two times in a row. That's really funny to think about. Yes. Um, directed by Tim Burton. Directed by Tim Burton. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'd watch the shit out of that. It's just it's me movie. without my planet. <laughs> Uh, they call him a dad dirty human. And he's like, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'm way into it. Let's let's oh. let's get Tim Burton to make that movie. And all you gotta do is, well, I guess you can't shoot the Paul Rubens stuff. Damn it! I was gonna say all you gotta do is resurrect Paul Rubens. I was gonna say green screen, <laughs> just green screen him into the movie. Like, but I guess you can't because he's no. straight up dead. That sucks. He is, and it does. Um. Yeah, man. I again. I. 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 I, mm, I feel weird because I did love this movie so much as a kid, or I convinced That's myself okay. that I loved it. You know, and to go back, and I'm just like, we've got Chris Christopherson in this movie for no Barely. reason. Yeah, for no reason he's in this movie. David Warner in this movie for no reason. 
um, yeah. the the great Eric Avari in this movie, they give him the fucking Wilhelm scream. Yeah. F- He's been talking in this like low voice the entire movie. And then a- 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 Atar picks him up and it's ah! <laughs> like a top five worst use of the Wilhelm scream for me. I just stop using it. Honestly, I'm over it. Like, that's cool. But like, I'm over it. The most egregious use of the Wilhelm scream for me is Dante's Peak, where they use it in what is supposed to be like a very like sentimental, heartfelt death. Like you're supposed to care that this character has died. And as he's falling into the lava, they give him the Wilhelm scream. And I'm just like, well, fuck you guys. Sounds fantastic. It's (laughs) the worst. You would be, but no, I hate it. I hate it so much. I love undercutting dramatic moments with you dumb do. shit. You <laughs> bastard fan. man. You bastard man. Oh, God. Should we? Shall we? Yeah, I think that we should. Let's 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 move past the halfway point here and do the plot. All right. So the plot in 60 seconds, part of the show where we at the behest of the coin of justice uh, will determine which of us will be discussing or will be recounting. That's the word. The plot of this film, 2001's Planet of the Apes in 60 seconds or less. I have here at the ready the coin of justice. Tucker, you, sir, call it in the air. Okay, it's heads. Oh, do we do it again or Uh, should we do it again? Find it first. This man, this man has dropped the coin. We don't even know where it is. It's gone. It's gotta be around here somewhere. I can I can dig out the Canadian quarter of indifference if you can't find it. I mean, I, I look, I know it's here somewhere. I just don't know where it fell. Oh, that's too bad for you, dude. It's too bad for all of us, really. This is too bad for everyone involved. Oh, well, that's not it. All right, I'll get I'll get down on my hands and knees later and and look around because I don't. Okay. I don't want to lose that. I can dig it. Let me find... Oh, I'm dropping coins everywhere. It's in here somewhere. See, I'm not the only one. Shut up. It's here. There it is. The Canadian coin of the indifference. Canadian we coin got of indifference. We got we it. We got the moose and we got the queen. Queen is heads, moose is tails. And that's true, Stephen. You call it in the air. I'm going to call heads. And it is heads. You know what that means. That means Steven has to do the plot. No, it doesn't. It means the other one. Well, I certainly don't like that, but at least this one's an easy one. All right. Uh, I have 60 seconds on the clock. I will give you the 30 and 10 second warnings, as I always do. Your time will begin whenever you do. Uh, Mark Wahlberg's got a monkey, and he has to go into space to explore this like space storm or whatever. And for some reason, Mark Wahlberg goes after him, and he ends up on the planet of the apes, where apes are like humans, and humans are like apes, except more like slaves instead of like you know, just other animals that sometimes we put in cages. And like so, him and some other humans escape from being slaves, and Helen Bonham Carter monkey helps them. And they walk for a real long time, and they go over some water, and then straight up... Has it been 30 seconds yet, Stephen? Oh, yeah. Sorry. 25 seconds left. Okay. And so then they decide to fight all the other apes to, like, gain their freedom or whatever. And, like, he uses a rocket engine to set some of them on fire. And then his monkey comes and saves everybody, and they think he's a god. And they trap the really bad guy, and everybody else just decides to be nice to humans after that. And he goes back to his world, but it's not his world. It's full of apes as well, the end. That's right on the nugget, man. That was good. That was good. That was good. That felt good. good. That felt real, real good, Steven. I'm glad you liked it, man. And you know what? I'm going to reward myself by um, going to pee real quick. Sounds good. So, uh, Tucker, cut this out. Well, I'll say, well, cut this part out before and I'll put a five minutes later, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Five minutes later. Hello. Hey, look what I found. Hey, there it is. Uh, I'm sorry. I have the world's smallest bladder. I don't know how I make it through any of these, honestly. Dude, I have diabetes and I don't have to pee as much as you do. 
You don't understand. Look, that's why I bring a whole bunch of drinks to work with me, but I just sip. Most of the time, I'll just sip on one of them because if I drink anything at a normal speed every five minutes, I have to, there are some times where I will pee, I will wash my hands, and as I'm leaving the bathroom, I'll have to pee again. It's like it's like my bladder has shrunk. So like, let's say I drink a twelve ounce beer, right? And my bladder is so small that just a little bit of that beer gets in there. I have to pee, like maybe two ounces. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But instead of coming all at once and being like, "Hey, you should go pee this out," it's like, "Here's a little bit. Go do that." Oh, hey, here's a little bit more. Go pee some more. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I, I, oh, here's some more. Go. It sucks, man. I got a pregnant lady's bladder. I've heard of a teacup bladder, man, but you've got like a, not even a shot glass, but you've got like a thimble bladder, man. I got a thimble bladder, dude. That's it's what it is. It's made of my existence. But anyway, man, I killed that plot in 60 seconds. That was the best <laughs> one in a while. You did, you did well, man. You did well. I really nailed it. I didn't go too Best. far into it. I didn't get stuck in that normally where like you explain too much at the beginning. No, dude, I cruised right through that shit. Like it's pro. almost like you're you're well practiced enough at this point. I've done it a few times. I actually haven't done it that often. Like most of the time, it falls to you. And I was going to say it's most. Brett. I haven't. It's mostly me. Yeah, I've been on this podcast for about a year and a half, and I've only missed two episodes. And I feel like I've only done the plot a handful of times, dude. Yeah, it's mostly me. Yeah. Like, that's just kind of the reality of the situation. I don't know why. Sometimes the coin hates me, I guess, but... The coin does not favor you, that's for sure. No. Uh, the the D6 favored me last time, um, but the, uh, the coin did not favor me last week. But the Canadian nope. Corps of Indifference likes me this week, so I'll take it. I guess so. I guess so. Normally it's on my side, but whatever. I will take it. Um, I mean, so this was so let's let's talk Helena Bottom Carter a little bit. Um yes, please. She this is I think is this my first Helena Bottom Carter movie? You ain't see Fight Club though? Probably not. I think that was my first one. No, it was. Okay, that was my first Helena Bonham Carter. I was going to say, maybe not until after I saw this, but no, I definitely saw that before this. Um, and that, for better or for worse, has shaped my opinion of every performance of hers afterwards. You know what? Fight Club wasn't even my first Helena Bonham Carter. Really? You know what was my first Helena Bonham Carter? I wish you'd tell me. The TV miniseries Merlin. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that. That looked dumb. With Sam Neill and yeah. um, Helena Bonham Carter, M Martin Short is in it, John Gielgud, James mm -hmm. Earl Jones, Rutger Hauer, Miranda Richardson, oh. Isabella Rossellini, Lena Headey, like fucking great cast. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's my first uh, that's my first exposure to uh, to Helena Bonham Carter was as uh, the Queen uh, Queen Mab in uh in that mini series oh, good so. for her man yeah man good for her. i i bought that one on vhs like right after it came out that was a thing that i did so, how yeah, many that's tapes my first, was it on uh i think it might have just been on one. Oh wow i think it was just on one well, um, but yeah that was my first helena bottom carter although before that she i'm here's the thing about helena bottom carter is she's kind of the and i feel bad saying this but at least in like the 90s she gets saddled with the kind of homewrecker label a little sure. bit mainly because she is in howard's end with i think it's howard's end with emma thompson and kenneth brana and sure. is it that one or is it i think it might be another one because i don't think kenneth brana is in this but basically, Kenneth Branagh leaves Emma Thompson for Helena Bonham Carter. Yeesh. And then Helena Bonham Carter leaves Kenneth Branagh for Tim Burton. Who leaves Lisa Marie. Correct. For Helena just Bonham the, Carter. Uh, I just look. Lisa Marie is not even a snack. She's an entire meal. And I don't know, man. She's she's wild. 
I met her once. She's fucking wild, dude. I had to get away from her. I was afraid she was going to eat me. Really? Yes. She's a wild lady. Wild, wild lady. I want to hear all these yeah. stories once we, once we stop <laughs> recording. I have photos. I can't wait oh, to see man. them. Yeah. She's crazy, dude. She's I mean, crazy. and like, so they, they, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he ends his previous relationship for her. Probably. So like it seems to be a, a trend, but then his Tim Burton's marriage to Helena Bonham Carter then starts to dip once the two of them do a movie with Ava Green, um, in Dark Shadows, which is I think the last movie he's done with Carter and Depp. I think it's the last movie he does with both of them. And look, I didn't hate Dark Shadows. I did, but. I, it doesn't, it's not a very Tim Burton movie to me. It's kind of, um, it's kind of like if, like, maybe the, in the 90s when they were resurrecting all the 60s and 70s TV shows and making really funny movies out of them, like Adam's yes. Family and Brady Bunch and that shit. Correct. That, that was the Tim Burton Dark Shadows was that, but about 15 years too late. I agree. And I thought I I thought it was funny actually I thought it was really funny but it didn't it I I don't think of it as a Tim Burton movie I know he directed it but when I think of Tim Burton movies I don't think of Dark Shadows I mean I don't think of a lot of his late stage stuff I think of the earlier yeah. stuff honestly yeah um but he's I I get I don't know if they were ever like official officially together but like they were like shot together a lot him and Ava Green. Um, and now he's with Monica Bellucci. It's the, gotta be the hair, man. I don't know what it is, man. Um, but yeah, he's, he's apparently with Monica Bellucci now. And I, is Monica Bellucci in, I don't know if she's in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I kind of want to know now if she is, cause that's, I mean, that's kind of his thing. That's kind of what he does. Yeah. I mean, and that's probably easy to do, honestly. Yeah. I'm not but, saying it's the right thing or the decent thing to do, but uh, I'm probably it's probably pretty easy. Got a lot of pretty talented gals around you. It's mm -hmm. hard not to fall in love sometimes, I suppose. Sure, I imagine. I imagine so. Um, Monica Bellucci is she's playing spoiler, I guess, if you don't want to know this and you've not looked up anything for the movie, Beetlejuice's wife. Oh wow, that's interesting. That's fucking interesting. Okay. I'm still look. It's man. I hope it's good. I want it to be so good. Oh, I didn't know he was in this movie. That's gonna Who be fun. Uh, spoiler, I guess. Again, Willem Dafoe. Oh yeah, I heard he was gonna be in it. Yeah, I wonder who he's gonna a, be. A ghost detective who, in life, was a B movie action star. Hey, see, now this sounds like old Tim Burton, Steve. Come on, that's some old Steve Burton. T Steve Burton? Good old Steve Burton. No, it's your cousin, is. Steve Burton. <laughs> you remember that new weird look you were you were searching for? Well, check this out. Mm. Wowzers. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Good old Steve Burton. <laughs> it's it's got It's got three writers attached. Alfred Goff, Miles Miller, and Seth Graham Green, uh, who we have discussed uh, previously on this podcast when we talked about Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. <sighs> that that movie was could have been better. That's what I'll say. Could have been a lot Agreed. better. A lot our uh, our better. our mutual friend uh, JP Leck was on that episode. Oh yeah, that's right. We need to get him back on the schedule. We need to get him back in here. Yeah, dude. I'm gonna Maybe be I'm gonna be it. seeing him in a few weeks, so I'll I'll put a bug in his ear about it. Yeah, I saw that on the calendar and I got confused. I was like, wait, did I commit to something that I forgot about? Oh, did but I put it on the the shared you calendar put it on the disenfranchised uh, calendar? Yeah. Oops. I was very confused there for a minute. It's Not one of the bad. only things you've put on there in a while, Stephen. Look, man. I, look, the last week has been <laughs> no. And that's all I will say on Mike. Uh, last no, week yeah, has dude, been rad. whatever nuts. So I ain't mad at you. Like Tupac said, I ain't mad at you. You a down ass bitch, Steven, but I ain't mad at you. 
I don't know what any of that means, but thank you. Um, That's all right. Yeah, it's a compliment. Ugh. Are we ready to get into the ending of this movie? Yeah, please. Let's. Let's. We've all, the, well, we've already talked about at length the only part of this movie that's worth talking about, which is Paul Giamatti. So, yes. I mean, we've talked about other things that I enjoy, like the makeup effects. I Again, I really enjoyed. They're great. They are fantastic, yes. But they're ugly as hell. I agree. Yeah. And the designs, I hate the armor. It's so stupid and ugly and, and ribbed for no reason. No, it's and... not ribbed for no reason. It's ribbed for her pleasure, damn it. I guess. I guess. Speaking of the ending, I liked the actual human clothes on the primates there. I thought that was uh, that was a nice touch. And also, I, just... I like this ending because fuck Mark Wahlberg, man. <laughs> How like did you he... feel about Abraham Lincoln? Look, I thought it was all... Like, here's the thing. Every time this movie tries to surprise you, they telegraph it so hard yeah. that... Like when the monkey came and saved it, when the spaceship came down, I'm like, oh, it's the monkey. Yes, yeah, the monkey. It's the- come on, it's- just put it down. It's the monkey. Just show, open it up. It's the monkey. It's the fucking monkey. Come on. Right. And they even have the helmets all blurred out. And it's like, it's, we know it's the fucking monkey. But you get on with it. Mm hmm. And that's how that whole sequence felt. It was like, oh, he's home, right? I'll bet that voice on the other end, air traffic control, I'll bet that's motherfucking eight. And mm. then he walks into the. Why does he even go in there? Why would wouldn't he just like maybe go to a street to try and find someone? Why does he walk into the Lincoln Memorial? Why? Well, he, he crashes right in front of it. So I, I understand, but why do you just walk up to? Him? Oh, you know, I haven't seen the Lincoln Memorial in a while. I just crashed the spaceship. I might as well take a look at it, see what's up, see if it's changed at all. Can I just oh, tell look at you that it's changed? How much I enjoy the fact that Mark Wahlberg is supposed to be playing this like hot shot pilot. And he cannot land a spacecraft to save his fucking He's life. The, his monkey does it better. Correct. And he even calls that Much out. Much like, better. Hey, monkey. Landed the plane better hey. than I did. So how do you mother fool me? So that was a great landing. Hey. Hey, chicken. That was great. But wait. <laughs> I got it mixed up. Yeah, you dude, the that ending, guy, I'll punch you in the face. It felt very, very um, predictable. Mm -hmm. it was and... apparently more in line with the ending of the original novel which features the main character landing on what he thinks is earth and basically a general or a, a military officer rides up to him in a jeep and it turns out to be an ape and so they like fly off in, into space um like that's that's the ending of the original novel and now the the writing on the memorial um that made it seem like this was the future of the world he had just come from, kind of? I would, no, okay, so here's... So because here's it looked just like Tim Roth. Abe Lincoln looked like Tim Roth. It was, and it, it says behind it, um, basically something, blah, 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 General Fade, who freed the, like, who who freed the apes on this planet. it's bizarro it's the bizarro version of the world he just came from okay so here's the, Where the main thing that happened happened differently the ending of this movie was so confusing uh like tim roth was like i watched it twice i don't know what the fuck just happened yeah Meanwhile, i read that <laughs> hell on a bottom card is like i don't know what the big deal was about the ending was so confusing that for those who bought the dvd like i did they had to put in the dvd and insert to explain how that might have happened. Now, feasibly, that would have been explained in a sequel. And in fact, Tim Burton was like, yeah, that's I all. I think just that was the whole point of it. Sequel. Yeah. Yeah. But and, you know, as far as from what I read, he was just kind of like he was doing a Halloween five where it was he was like, good luck. Good mm -hmm. luck, guys who write the sequel. Idiots. Peace. Yeah. <laughs> Come out. I fucked you. Yeah, Seriously. I fucked you. Don't forget who fucked you. Tim Burton fucked you. Um, but yeah, basically, yeah, it, it, that, it, that very much strikes me in this, in this ending, this ending feels like a big fuck you to the people who've been watching this movie the, up to this point and, and the, the poor, poor bastards that have to write the sequel. <laughs> Correct. Um, but they had to, so essentially the, the conceit is that Fade manages to escape from his imprisonment within the Oberon, like, you know, he's going to gets the ship that was that Wahlberg sunk at the bottom of the lake, finds a way to dig it back up and, and fix it and uses it. 
and he exits the cloud feasible or presumably years later. And so he goes further back in time than, than Mark Wahlberg did. And so he goes in, say maybe to the 1800s in America, in America and ends up creating the ape uprising that by present time now leads to the civilization he, that we see. He's old Biff and back yes. to the future too. He's Basically. old Biff. He's yeah. old Biff. Yeah. That's all you had to say, Steven. He's old Biff. And I'd be like, got it. Fucking got it, dude. Okay. I understand. But, I, but again, this, this was in, there was an ins and I can't find a picture of it. Like I looked for an illustration of it online. I couldn't find it. Um, yeah. You know what I couldn't understand was I, as predictable as this movie was when he was shooting inside of the bulletproof glass and it was ricocheting around. Mm -hmm. How did one of those bullets should have hit him and yep. how did it not? Correct. And why did it not? And I kept yep. expecting it to, and it never fucking happened. Nope. All those bullets bullets in that small small space there's no way he dodged all of them as they were ricocheting around correct i just thought that was absurd like insult to injury there basically it's like okay we finally get tim roth's character who i hate the performance i hate the character i hate everything about that that character and he's finally in a position to just straight up die nope he just cowers under a shelf after so I somehow like matrix dodging a hundred ricocheting bullets. Um, the, so with regard to Tim, uh, to Tim Roth's performance, all of the ape actors had to go to an ape camp, basically uh, led by the great Terry notary who played the ape in Nope. Yep. Uh, Terry notary legit. Very good. Uh, he and Andy Serkis are like the foremost like motion capture guys. Like they're, they're the, the monkey two. guys. Yeah, they are. They're the sure. two. Um, and, but yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of the physical things that Tim Roth is bringing uh, are come out of that camp, like the sniffing everything. Like he sniffs everything. And Roth actually went to Burton at one point and said, Hey, can you like rewrite some of these lines and make me feel more menacing? And Burton's like, yeah, sure. So like it's Roth's call to go that big. Like Roth's the one yeah. that wants to go that big. And Burton's the one going, yes, please let's get you bigger. Like, I don't know if he just felt like he had to go that big because he was under the prosthetics or what it was, but like there was something for me, dude. Right. And I, I don't think he's half bad. But I don't think he's half good either. There's like that. I can, that there's some moments that I really like and some moments where I'm like, that's a little too much mustard, dude. Look, it's Tim Roth. And I know he's doing his, be his best. And I know he's making the decisions as an actor that he thinks are correct. Mm -hmm. But not everyone is perfect all the time. And I don't think he made the right decisions, the right choices, acting choices in this film. I think he took it in a direction that just is embarrassing to watch, mm -hmm. honestly. But I, it doesn't take away anything as an actor, for me at least. It doesn't make me think of him as less of an actor because I know he's better than that. Oh yeah. But like I say, you don't you're you don't get it right all the time. Nobody does. So. Do you know who they originally wanted to play General Fade in this movie? No. Who was it? Gary Oldman. <laughs> he's in the new ones that's what i heard yeah yeah but they wanted him in this one um mark Wahlberg wanted to be in this movie so badly that he dropped out of playing the Mar the matt damon role in oceans 11 oceans 11 yeah movie. good not a great he career move for him but yeah but at least he didn't stink up oceans 11 <laughs> true i you know that's that i take damon we... any day oh 100 any yeah. fucking day definitely except at the end of uh except at the end of the departed but yeah yeah they're i'm they're good in the roles they have in the departed yes correct yeah yes 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 yeah. but i have to if i have to pick one of them it's gonna be damon every time oh agreed i mean damon is more consistently good than Wahlberg for sure yeah he's got the chops he's he proven does. it time and time again he does um yeah they i don't know man this there are things I like about this movie, but there are more things I dislike about this movie. Like the things I like about this movie don't 
cover. I mean, Michael Clark Duncan. I love my, uh, the great Michael Clark Duncan. I love him. I, I feel like he's kind of wasted in this. He, he's just he a big wasted. guy. I don't like his performance in this either, which also hurts me to say the only other ape that I thought gave a performance that fit in this movie. Glenn Chaddix. I don't, I don't remember who that was, but I'm the, talking the about ape with the big jowls, man, the Senator dude. No, no, no. I'm talking about the dude that was with Helen Bottom Carter, her like guard guy. Or whatever. Carrie, who Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa. That guy was good. He, he, was fantastic. I thought he was enough ape like to be convincing, but he wasn't overdoing it like some people, Tim mm. Roth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like a uh, Tim Roth could have could have taken a lot of notes from that guy's performance for sure. For sure, for sure. Uh, I Love did you, like Tim a Roth. I did like a whole research like timeline of the development hell of this movie, but I don't even know if we need it anymore. Oh man. I don't know. I don't know, man. Basically, here's so here's the takeaway. Uh, the big takeaway is that um, in 99, they basically offered uh, William Broyles Jr., who is a big fan of just stranding Tom Hanks in places. He wrote Apollo yeah. 13 and Castaway. He's that guy, yeah. He's that guy. Um, they're like, look, you can you, you want to write the Planet of the Earth reboot? He's like, no. And they're like, you Fair. can do whatever you want. And he's like, no. <laughs> he's like, no, thanks. Uh, and then he goes outside and like gazes up at the stars and is like, you know what? This could be fun. And they're like, no, he, he calls him back. He's like, so no restrictions whatsoever. And they're like, no, he's like, does it have to have apes in it? And it's mm, a planet of the apes. It's in the title. Apparently he was only half joking when he said that, but like, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, but I look at like other variations of this movie that could have been the one I'm we have most... is possible casts, Stephen. Some interesting okay. possible casts. So in '88, you've got Adam Rifkin attached to write and direct. His script is actually available online. I have a copy oh, of it, um, and it's like Spartacus with apes. Is was his conceit? Um, I would hate that, but I'll bet even if it was good, I would hate that. So uh, you got you got uh, Tom Cruise and or Charlie Sheen being pursued for the starring role as a descendant of Charlton Heston. Um, Danny a Elfman. Sequel. Yeah, it's but it's like a, the original Lega sequel where they're a like legacy sequel. Yeah, where they're going just the like like David Gordon Green's Halloween, where like just the first one is canon and fuck the rest. Oh, I don't like that. But like in 1988, he was doing that. Mm. So, yeah, I mean that's innovative, but for this franchise, I'm not a fan. And apparently, the movie the movie that he wanted to make was essentially Gladiator with apes. Like that's essentially what he wanted to do. Oh. Uh, Danny Elfman was attached to to the score. Um, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh pitch uh, a movie about the apes going through the Renaissance. Uh, they write oh, a cool. a Leonardo da Vinci esque role for for Roddy McDowell, who's really excited. Uh, studio kind of doesn't really want to do it. So Peter Jackson's like, fine, I'll just make Heavenly Creatures instead. I'd rather have that than the King Kong remake, which wasn't bad. I'm just saying. Dude, I love that King Kong remake. But I'm glad that he did Heavenly Creatures, though, because that's a really good movie. That's his straight story. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it right now. That's his straight story. It's a, um, It's also his breakout. Like that's his like the movie that puts him on the map. It kind of is. I, I mean, in America, I it is. Now, yeah. Stephen, Stephen, you weren't a horror fan in those days, so it, it, it's a different perspective. As a horror fan, we've been watching Bad Taste and Dead Alive for years, but we were ready, dude. Here's what I'm saying though: is that Heavenly Creatures is the movie that gives him the cachet to make the frighteners gives him the cachet to make Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Like, so sure, that's no, what I, mean I, I agree brain. with you. I like, agree with you. I'm just saying him opportunities that he gets later in his career. I think he was on the radar of certain, certain circles like sure. way before that. And we were kind of waiting, kind of waiting for him to, for Hollywood to notice. Sure. Sure. And that's why, I mean, heavenly creatures is really good too. It is. Have you it's seen very it? good. You've seen it. Yeah. yeah. It's been years, but yeah, I have. Um, yeah. In the mid nineties, you get an attempt by the producers of natural born killers. Uh, um, the studio is like, I'm only interested if Oliver Stone directs Oliver Stone's like, fuck that. I don't want to, I don't like the planet of the apes movies. Natural born killers. That's, that's one of my big red flags. If I meet someone 
over the age of, say, I'm going to be generous and say 25, and Natural Born Killers is their favorite movie, instant red flag. Agreed. Instant red flag. Agreed. Um, Stone did come on to executive produce. Uh, the guy who wrote the scripts for Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome. Oh, nice. Wrote the screenplay. Yes. Um, this is Philip, the one I want to see. Philip Noyce of Clear and Present Danger and Patriot Games was attached to direct. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was attached to star. We will get Harrison Ford in this? No. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Fuck. dude. Give me Harrison Ford playing of the apes. I'd watch the shit out of that. Um, but there is uh, one of the studio heads is like insistent that there's a scene with apes playing baseball and they're trying to figure out the game of baseball, but they're missing an element. And so the human character like shows them like like becomes the pitcher and then they figure it out and start playing baseball. Uh, and he was like dead set on this film being included. So Hayes turns in a draft of the script that doesn't have the baseball in it. So he's fired and Noyce goes, well, fuck you. I'm off with him because they had done dead calm together. So yeah. Noyce leaves to do the saint. See our previous episode on the saint. Oh, I like um, that movie. Stone eventually leaves as well. So they bring on Chris Columbus to direct. He of home alone and Mrs. Doubtfire fame. Yeah. And like, uh, he did that Harry Potter movie too. The first two, yeah. He teams yeah. up with Sam Hamm, who wrote Tim Burton's Batman 89, uh, to make a more kid-friendly version of the apes after Columbus. Because cause kids bring their parents and buy popcorn and movie tickets, I guess, man. But I, I mean, you don't, I don't, uh, with a series like Planet of the Apes, I don't feel like you have to tone it down, honestly. I mean, as long I as you don't get too graphic with it. Even What was this movie rated? PG-13? Yeah. Like, this would have been an easy PG in the 80s or in the 90s. Like, it's I not. think the original Planet ones the Ape- are all PG, too. Yeah, they are. Every single one of them, yes. This is for fa- this is a family sci-fi series, Stephen. Chris Columbus uh, leaves after his mom dies. And uh, guess who steps up to replace him? Maybe one of the biggest sci-fi directors of all time. I don't know. Jimmy Cameron. Oh, that's your boy, your boy, Mr. Cameron. Yeah, Jimmy Cameron. Arnold is still attached to Star, and so Cameron's like, "I'll write, I'll produce. I'm not going to direct it, though." Um, but then after Titanic hits really big, Cameron's like, "You know what? I'd rather just do my own thing because that's where I've had the most." Maybe I don't have to make genre films anymore, right? Is that what he's saying? Well, <laughs> Maybe no, I don't have to make genre films exclusively. He, says, he said, "There's a quote I read. I don't have it here in front of me, but basically, he's like, I'm 44." Um, all of my biggest hits were original ideas like the abyss terminator um true lies like all these things were like these were my ideas so like why do i need to like riff on something someone else i think the only movie he, movies he did that were based on another person's ideas were aliens and piranha 2 the spawning are the only ones that are really based on someone else's concepts yeah so yeah, he's just like, I don't, I don't need that. So he backs out. They pitch to Michael Bay, Roland Emmerich. They try to hit up Peter Jackson again. They all say no. Project dies. 1999, right before they pitch it to Broyles, uh, the, the, the Hughes brothers of Menace to Society and Dead Presidents. Oh, fame. yeah. I, oh, I love Dead Presidents. Steven, watch Dead Presidents. Okay. That's an early, an early Chris Tucker um, dra- dramatic performance. Ooh. Probably his first. I was gonna honestly. say you don't do he's a lot fan- of those. He's fantastic in that movie. That whole film, that's the Hughes Brothers movie right there. Yeah. Like their other stuff is fine. It's even good. But Dead Presidents, it's like Men- Menace to Society is on Criterion 4K right now. Look, I understand that. And Menace to Society is a classic for a reason. But Dead Presidents takes Menace to Society and mixes it with like a heist movie and a coming of age neighborhood story. Hmm. And it's so, so good. And is it streaming anywhere? Because I kind of want to watch it ASAP. I always forget about it. The trailer is very misleading. Like they marketed that wrong, which if it did not do well, that's why. Because boy, did they market that movie wrong. Uh, Dead Presidents is currently streaming. If you have a library card, it's currently streaming on Hoopla. I don't even have a New Hampshire driver's license yet, Steven. I don't have a fucking library card. Get Can I rent your, it? Uh, it is rentable on iTunes, I, Apple TV, Google Play, 
Prime Video and Vudu. I'd buy that on 4K. Honestly, I'd watch the crap out of that on 4K because that is a beautiful film. Uh, Looks like maybe we have a Blu-ray. Nope, just a DVD. Yeah, just a DVD, man. Son of a bitch. I'll just watch. I'll rent it streaming them so I can watch it in HD at least. There you go. I might buy it for the voodoo so I can share it with everyone. That'd be nice. Because you should see it. It's really, really good. I'd be a lot more likely to watch. I've only seen one Hughes Brothers movie, and I think it's Book of Eli. That one's, look, I. that's a good movie, but I don't like it. And that's all I'll it. say. I it's a it. really good movie, but I just can't appreciate the tone, and I I just can't get into it. I recognize that's that fine. it's good, but I can't fucking get into it. That's fine. That's fine. You're allowed. You're allowed to not like something, man. Thank you, Stephen. I, I give you permission to not like something. Thank you so much. No problem. That's what I'm here for, man. Um, but yeah, and uh, they their version would have been a lot more socially motivated and would have been dealing with uh, race, American racial tensions in the late 90s, early 2000s. And probably would have been, again, a lot more culturally relevant than this thing was. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the the brief overview of the development hell that this movie went through before finally getting made. And how did it do once it got released? I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, just before you say that, I am very much ready to move on to that. But I wanted to say that it it shows that they spent a lot of money on this movie and it shows that a lot of people behind the scenes worked very, very hard on this movie. And I think for me that just makes it suck so much more because of how much effort people put into this like they put their hearts and souls into it and it's just it's just garbage it sucks yeah it sucks so bad yeah it's i like about 10 minutes in i don't even want to watch it anymore like i said i'm just like hoping paul giamatti pops up as often as possible like Every time he's not there, I'm like, is he going to, can he come back though? And man, him at the end, like, I know, like, buy some aspirin. I love that they didn't, like, turn him into a good guy, but they just kind of, like, repurposed him in this new world. That as, was, like, the original not as, conceit. not as big. He, he's still a scumbag, but at least he's not a tra- slave trader anymore right. you know right. what i mean <laughs> like that's all the redemption arc he gets that's all he deserves and it's fucking perfect yeah that everything was the that has to do with paul arc. giamatti in this movie is fantastic and perfect please continue steven no that was the original arc but both paul giamatti and tim burton are like this is lame no, so no, let's just no. keep him an asshole please and uh he's yeah just, that's what they did he's just trying to save his own ass at all times at all times at all times going with whatever is the most advantageous for him in the moment. If I could just get a, a Paul Giamatti super cut of this movie, I would watch it often. Probably. I love him in this movie so much. And that might just be because he is a reprieve, like the little bit of light shining in the darkness. That yeah. is this movie. Uh, so this movie opens on uh, July 27th, 2001. That is just shortly after my birthday. That it's the year. summer think, of my graduation, Stephen. I think that would have, that was the summer of my graduation as well. Oh, yeah, dude. I graduated I also, that May. I also graduated Fucking that May. Conseco Fieldhouse, dude. That's where oh, uh, was. Covenant Christian High School Gymnasium. Yeah, well, um, that's why I'm rad and you're lame. Well, fuck you. Um, <laughs> Steven. It's all, there's all, you. it's all love, dude. It's all love. I know, dude. I know. Bonk. Um, um, Half a bonk. I, I mean, that my other hand is just over here. Um, I, I don't even want to know, dude. No, you don't. Um, head check, head check, everybody. <laughs> okay, good. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, it opens uh, number one at the box office the week it comes out to yeah. sixty-eight point five million dollars on its way to a pretty healthy domestic gross of one eight uh, one hundred and eighty thousand uh, domestic. But I mean that's just a little less than half of that 
box office. So, you know, not well, as great as they probably wanted it to be in terms of. We were excited for it. Everybody yeah. was excited. For, we People were fucking hyped. I was hyped for this movie. I was ready. I will look up what it does. It's down 60% in the second weekend. Uh, and then down another 52% in the third weekend. Uh, so by the third weekend, it's earned most of its, it's 148 million. It's earned most of its domestic box office at this point. That's um, that word of mouth in a bad way. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, number two at the box office is Jurassic Park 3. Joe Johnston's Jurassic Park 3. Oh, uh, Joe Johnston. It, that's his misfire, I feel like. That's if if this is Tim Roth's mistake, <laughs> Jurassic Park 3 is his mistake. Um like. all right, that's fair. That's fair, I guess. Uh number three, America's Sweethearts. Hey, that was uh, okay. Alan yeah. Arkin's in that. Big plus. There's a lot of people in that. Um Yeah, but Alan fourth... Arkin's the most important. Okay, whatever. Calm down. So what's fourth? Uh Legally Blonde. Oh, cool. Everybody loves that movie. Everybody. Um, and in, in fifth place, Frank Oz's The Score in fifth place there. Marlon Brando, Robert His, De Niro, Marlon Edward Brando's Norton. Final performance. Who's the fourth? Fuck. I've never Brando, seen it. Brando, De Niro, I... Norton, and? It came out when I worked at the video store. That's the only reason I know all that. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, I have no idea. Angela Bassett. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, I love Angela Bassett, but I was never going to, that was never going to be a guess. So she wasn't on the cover, man. The other three were on the cover. She should have been. Like I said, uh, I worked at the video store and it came out. I haven't seen it. All I know is the cover, Steven. It's red. Uh, in sixth place, Dr. Doolittle 2. Uh, in seventh LOL. place, Cats and Dogs, uh, which is, I think, that movie about. The uh, Cats and dogs where they fight each yes, other, yes, yes, right? like spies. And Sean Hayes is Mr. Yeah. Tinkles, yeah. Alec Baldwin's in it as a dog, um, sure, playing a Russian dog, I think. Uh, I in eighth know. place, The Fast and the Furious in this economy. Yeah, this is this tracks, these are all movies that came out when I worked at the video store, dude. Yeah, in ninth place, Scary Movie 2, and in 10th place, Shrek. In its 11th week, it's earned $255.5 million. Shrek mania. Big ass hit. Uh, and in 12th place, I just want to spotlight this because it's a future episode. Final Fantasy, colon, The Spirits Within. Oh, man. That's such a pretty boring movie. It's so pretty. It's so uh, boring. But yeah, like I said, it, it goes on to gross $180 million domestic, another 182 uh, internationally for a $362 million box office on a $100 million budget. So pretty good return, but not good enough not to greenlight a sequel. Fox basically said, hey, if it's successful, we'll do another one. It was relatively successful, but they decided not to move forward. When asked if he would want to do a sequel, Burton replied, I'd rather jump out a window. He didn't specify how high the window was. So, like, Correct. I mean, he could that could mean he wants to make one. Maybe they misinterpreted it. Maybe he meant, like, I want to jump out of the window of, like, a plastic toddler house in my yard. Sure. And just have a tumble, a fun yeah. tumble. Yeah, and it doesn't. I mean, maybe it maybe it's an open window, not necessarily a closed one. Exactly. You don't necessarily have to be breaking through grass to, glass to jump through a window. Not enough context, quite frankly. He could, he could want to jump out of a car window, a parked car window. How do you say some shit like that and then not expect people to speculate? I mean, you're just so vague. What kind of window? Absurd. The tomatometer score on the twenty two thousand one Planet of the Apes is forty three percent. The critics consensus the remake of Planet of the Apes can't compare to the original in some critics mind, but the striking visuals and B-movie charms may win you over. What B-movie charms? They're talking about the first one. So they're not talking about this one. I know B-movie charm there. Uh, the it's meta like score the opposite of B-movie charm is. I don't even know what that would be, but 
the Metascore is a 50 uh, based on mixed or average reviews from 50, from 34 critics, excuse me. And Tucker, you want to take a stab at the Letterboxd score? Uh, in between 2.7 and 3.1. It is a 2.3. Ooh, okay. Overshot right, box. I see you. Bit. I see you. Yeah. Much like Mark Wahlberg, you overshot your landing a little bit. Well, that man does not need to fly a spaceship. Nope. Last person I'm going to fly, fly a spaceship. Just Correct. put the monkey in your lap. Let mm-hmm. him do it. Yep. That's the move. Um, but yeah, so Tucker, I, I think I have an idea of what the answer might be. But out of five yeah. stars, how are you ranking 2001's Planet of the Apes? That's going to be a solid two stars with a bullet. And both of those stars go to Paul Giamatti. Uh, I'm going to go two on this one as well. I'm going to go two on this one as well. It's a solid two. Um, does it have redeeming characteristics? Yes. Um, does it have a lot of them? No. Um, so few of them, in fact, that I, uh, I mean, I feel like I've talked about all of them ad nauseum here. Like, yeah. There are things things I like about it. There are a lot of things I don't, and uh, more things I don't than things I do. So there it Will is. Will you watch stars. it again? Do you see yourself watching this again, and except for if it's for another podcast? I mean, I own it. So it's hey, look at some point. At some point, Tucker, I am going to watch through all of the Planet of the Apes. I was going to see. Yeah, if you do a watch through, yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. That's totally fair. You but really like, should watch I, the show, though, as well, Stephen. At least the live action one. The animated the live, one, eh, whatever. The, the live, live action, action show one, is good as fuck. I don't think it's streaming anywhere right now. I looked it up, and I didn't see that it was streaming. Well, anywhere. you better get a bootleg DVD from a, a, a sci-fi convention or something, dude, because I I have not seen it in a long time, but like I have very fond memories of watching that with my sister and my dad. We were way into that. Don't remember anything about it. I just remember being way into it. Yeah, it is. It, um, again, I had a few I can action the, figures. I can get the uh, the DVD on Amazon for about twenty eight bucks. So, oh, I don't that know is if it's worth twenty eight dollars, Stephen. Is it not streaming that's, anywhere? That's like no. That's what I just said. Not um, n- no, not even on YouTube. No. Oh, I don't know about YouTube. I haven't looked on YouTube. Uh, but the animated series is also not streaming anywhere. That one, though, I'm pretty sure I can't buy it. Uh, it's on YouTube. It is? Yep, got you a playlist right here, buddy. Right on. I'm going to hook you up. Do we include that in the show notes? Nah, they can find it. Just look up Planet of the Apes series, and right. you'll see a playlist. Sounds good. And uh, hopefully they got the animated show on there, too. Probably. But yeah, I own all those movies. I I am I'm gonna do a Planet of the Apes watch through one of these days. I will. And if you follow me on Letterbox, you'll probably read all about it. I'm excited but, uh, to hear about it. Honestly, I'd love to yeah. do a Patreon thing, but I I I know we could never commit to it because of our schedules. Our schedules are kind of insane right now, and you're you're in your busy season, Brett's. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Brett and I both have shit going on, so like it's it's kind of a miracle we were able to sit down and record this episode. Not going to yeah. lie. I'm really hoping that next week comes together because next week, uh, uh spoilers, uh, Jimmy's going to be here next week. Yeah. Doing and an it's a, straight it's a, up. I was going to say it's a fifth Thursday. So we got a straight up, straight up coming your way. We're going uh, straight just, up with, with a, just, I would say a standard guess at this point, there's a few people who are going to be, Pretty standard guests on Straight Up. Uh, one, of course, being JP Leck, and the other being Jimmy, because these are two dudes that I really like talking to all the time about everything. So, tune in go. next week. We're doing we're doing a Straight Up, and Jimmy's gonna be there. And look, I don't want to like bury the lead too much, but. He's got a new single coming out, mm. and it's real, real good. I uh, I saw some pics on his Instagram about uh, the some of the recording sessions on uh, some yes, of that stuff. Dude. So it's looks so pretty cool. Good, it's a looks really, really cool. good song. Yeah. 
But yeah, yeah. This is the disenfranchised podcast. Uh, you can find us on all the social media sites, or at least some of them, at Disenfranch Pod. Uh, the big ones: uh, Instagram, Letterboxd, Facebook, um, Blue Sky, and YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, head on over to patreon.com slash disenfranch pod uh, for five bucks a month. You get access to so much content, including an episode of what are we watching that Tucker and I recorded right before this episode uh, that mm-hmm. should be dropping uh, probably Sunday as of this record, as of this release date, my is my guest Sunday or Monday. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to try and get it out this weekend since we haven't done anything else with the Patreon. So which we again out. the we we're we're meaning to but again our schedules are just so insane that us getting together to record main feed is kind of a miracle these days so we have we have a plan for the patreon it just might take some time for we're us building to, to it for it to uh you know come to be but uh one thing we do have on the patreon is days of content days that but also the official <laughs> conversation hub of the disenfranchised podcast we drop all the main feed episodes right into your patreon feed so you can go ahead and listen directly from the patreon feed if you'd like and And you don't have to pay us you don't have to pay us that's at a free tier so you don't even have to pay for that it's actually Um, public you don't even have to join our patreon no like you should like at the free tier be a whole lot cooler i said i said them as public man and that's when here in the show when we're like Tell us in the comments if we ever, I don't know if we say that, but it sounds like something we would say. If we ever say that, those are the comments we're talking about. Those are the yeah. only ones. We yeah. don't look at comments anywhere else because really there's I don't read no, them. Except for anywhere. YouTube comments, YouTube, I guess, but we don't, but I don't read YouTube those. comments. I don't read I do. those. Oh, we don't get it. I don't. So there was one I that I didn't understand, so I responded with a song lyric. Cool. Uh, yeah. That's the move. The, the comment was nothing. The word nothing. Mm. And so I quoted a Ben Queller song and said, nothing isn't nothing, something, nothing that's important to me. That's right. That's how it should be. Sha sha. Sha do. End quote. Yeah. But yeah, Patreon, though, not YouTube. Patreon's where it's at. And if you want to support us uh, without paying us, uh, then please head to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and leave us a nice big old five-star rating and review, please and thank you. Uh, if you do leave us a review, especially on Apple Podcasts, we will read it on the podcast. I will just straight up read your words on this show. Uh, also, we have- I'd like to add another another part to that. I'm willing to do it in any voice that you choose. Just indicate it in your review what voice you want one of us to read it in. And uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. That. Just me. Then I will commit to that. If I'm you've heard me do that. an impression on this show, of which I've done some good ones and some bad ones, just let me know. Say Tucker, do it as Al Pacino, and I will fuck that up. And but it will be really funny. Just, you know, it, it'll it'll be something. Yeah, um, we'll have fun with it. Is what I'm saying. We will do something. Spice um, it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, so hit us up there. Five star rating and review, please. And thank you. Um, and yeah, you can find me on social media if you want. I'm Stephen Fox. We're the, your host here. Uh, you can find me at Chewy Walrus on Blue Sky, Instagram and Letterboxd. Uh, you can also buy my book. Uh, buy Stephen's a, book. I wrote a book, you guys, um, with my partner, uh, past and future guest Mandy Gossage. Uh, we wrote a uh, wrote a book. Uh, it's a comedy thriller, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, a thromedy? A thromedy? Yeah, maybe. Uh, a, I like that. A, a, a killer comedy? A, I don't know. Uh, a, a, a colostomy? Camiller? A camiller? I like my um, because poop. Maybe, right, yeah, poop. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah we love poop. poop. Um, poop but yeah, fun. you can find that on uh, Amazon. You can find it in ebook or paperback format. I can uh, get it physically. You oh can. yeah, because you you're gonna it. sign it. But I want to yeah. read it soon. I better. I can text me your address, Stephen. All right, I'll do it once we stop recording. Remind me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we, we wrote it. It, we're actually already working on our second book. We did some writing on it literally earlier today. Is it a sequel? Um, It's not a sequel. It is a completely different thing. 
does it take place in the same universe? Are we going to see some crossover at some point? Doubtful. Okay, that's fair. It it could, but I doubt it. But it it is going to tonally probably be very similar. So at least it, it it'll be a spiritual sequel if nothing else. Um, okay. because we're the ones writing it. And so our, our voices and our tones are going to be very similar there. Um, but yeah, so that, um, but yeah, buy my book, please. And thank you. Um, I'm doing it right now. I'm just waiting for you to send me your address. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> why, don't, why don't I, why don't I put it in the chat here? Yeah. Cause I'm just going to buy it and send it to you. So you and your partner can sign it. And then I'm going to stick you with the shipping to get it to me. I think I already have this. That's, that's crazy. Don't say, dude, you're going to give away. They don't know what. <laughs> they, but yeah, they, they do. Because <laughs> you idiot. Steven, be nice. I'm going to edit it out. Jeez, and also, I'm buying your book, asshole. I... <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck off. Touche. Touche. <laughs> I'm literally giving you money and you're calling me like a piece of shit all of a sudden. <laughs> Like, okay. All You're right. the one broadcasting my fucking address. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, uh, we have fun. Um, we are friends. T- Tucker edited all this out. Um, I will. <laughs> uh, if, if you want to find, oh, no, Brett's not on social media these days. Forget it. Don't find Brett on social media. If you already follow him, mm. cool. If not, don't worry about it. Um, Tucker, where can we find you on socials these days? You can find me on Instagram and YouTube at ice909. That's I-C-E-N-I-N-E, the number zero and the number nine. Also, of course, there's tuck mugs. I don't want to say too much about tuck mugs because, like you said before, this is a very busy season for me. And what I I'm, I'm really need to talk about as far as tuck mugs go is I need guest mugs, you guys. Look, it's hot outside. I'm working. I'm very rarely going to want coffee or soup. So I need your mugs. I need them. So this is a this is an emergency call out to all Tuck Mugs followers. Send me your mugs. Any mug. Send me a picture. Tell me what it means to you or the origin or both. And tell me what's in it. That's all. I, it's so simple. It's so easy. And you could keep a wholesome non-toxic community alive you share your mugs yeah. find some Hell friends yeah. we can all be friends let's all be friends let's all I be like friends, friends and share friends mugs cool. mug yeah. sharing yeah mugs are so harmless what yeah. could you possibly do with a mug that would that would not be rad yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah i don't think you could even hurt anybody with a mug i guess you could if you really tried but you have to try really hard to hurt somebody with a mug i feel like I mean, it depends on how, with what velocity you threw or bashed someone in the head with it. Uh, that's true. And also what the contents were and how hot they were. You could throw like Correct. a mug of piping hot coffee on someone. I'm just saying generally like Judge mugs Reinhold are at the not end violent. Of Fast Times at Ridgemont High with the coffee pot. <laughs> and at the end of the Clerks Animated Series episode, he's in, he does the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they do the same. They do the homage. Yeah. <laughs> He works at the quick stop. Oh, man. Oh, good times. Best thing Kevin Smith has ever done. And that's not an insult either. I'm just saying Clerks Animated Series is just that fucking good. Yeah. So good. Anyway, yeah, that's my socials. Uh, I'm I'm really trying to listen to records, you guys, but I had to loan my PA out to the campground, and I use my PA as a hi-fi um and fuck what you heard it sounds really great but i don't have my pa right now so i can't continue my alphabetical record listen through at the moment but soon i might in the next couple nights i might listen to a record if i have a chance to on my headphones since i don't have my pa and that's it that's me that's my socias. And speaking of Kevin Smith, uh, apparently he uh, at some point he joked with someone about um, what was it? Um, suing Tim Burton because he, the ending or part of the Jay and Silent Bob uh, comic book yeah. had like a ape Abraham Lincoln in it. And chasing so- Dogma. Yeah. So Chasing yeah. Dogma, it basically Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back is a rewrite 
of the right. comic book chasing dogma. A lot of the same things happen. He really and wanted the, the to tell Planet the of the Apes them with that monkey. Yeah, the Planet of the Apes riff in that movie is much more flesh, fleshed out and bigger in the comic book. Right. Uh, they're both good. Like, honestly, the Chasing Dogma is a little weird to read after you've seen Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Correct. But it's still it's still really good, I think. It is fun. It is a fun read. Um, but yeah, that is our episode on 2001's Planet of the Apes, a movie I've been waiting to cover for like four years on this podcast. And we finally did it. We got there. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find us. And uh, yeah, I am your host, Stephen Foxworthy, for my co-host Tucker and the absent Brett Wright. Until next time, say hi to your mother for me. <laughs> <laughs>